D Converted Man here. So before I get into this particular video, I wanted to talk a little bit about polls and poll questions. I was trying to communicate information to a commenter, but they didn't want to listen to reason and logic because it would ruin their whole entire argument, quote unquote, which isn't an argument. So the point I was making is that a poll question can be tailored to fit the prerogative of the person giving the poll. So the questions asked in the poll matter because they can result in a bias towards the favor that you want. So it may look like we gave this poll and 100 out of 100 people said yes to the question. Okay, but the question was asked only to these certain people and the question was asked in such a way that a no answer would have appeared to be ridiculous. So it doesn't really tell us much unless we analyze the questions that the poll has in and of itself. So, of course, he didn't want to understand that polls can be flawed. Oh, no, 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 this is a good poll. You won't answer the questions, yada, yada, yada. So the idea that polls can be flawed doesn't come from me. It comes from a PhD in logic. It's a subset of philosophy, but still a PhD in logic. So given the choice between a YouTuber who has no videos, thinks that Yahoo groups and Facebook are the place to debate such things, versus a PhD, I think I'll go with what the PhD says. So, no to that nonsense, and no to him. So, speaking of nonsense, here's John Lennox. Professor John Lennox, about the problem of evil and suffering. John, Richard Dawkins says that we observe in our world exactly the sorts of things you would expect if there's no rhyme and reason, no God, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Isn't he right, in a sense? That's the way it looks to him. And raising that question raises a very difficult question for people going through the traumas of suffering, having been on the wrong end of evil and so on. And I find it a very hard question as a Christian because it's the main reason, I would say, why many of my good friends don't believe in God. Let's not overlook this subtle straw man suggested here. Most of Lennox's friends probably don't believe in God because of the pain and suffering problem. Now, I don't know who Lennox's friends, so I don't know that that's the case, but it is a potential straw man here, and it is subtle. And I think it is supposed to mean something to us. Like, oh, look, his friends all disbelieve in God, not based on anything other than this horrible thing that they just don't understand how God can allow pain and suffering. That's why they disbelieve. I think that this is a potential straw man. Just wanted to point it out. So I feel the force of the argument. I think if we've never felt the force of that argument, we're not really human. I beg to differ here because there are people that are really human who don't feel the force of this idea because for whatever reason, they lack empathy. Now, perhaps they're a social path or perhaps they're just lacking that piece of their brain, but otherwise they're able to function within society perfectly well or who knows what issues they may or may not have, but yet they are still human. On the other hand, it seems to me there are two levels to it. There's an intellectual side and there's an emotional side. Oh, goody, goody, gumdrops. This whole bull that there's two sides to this problem is intellectual or and then there's emotional, see? So we're going to muddy the waters by taking the problem and saying that it's two problems when it's actually just one problem. But go ahead and tell us the two problems and how to deal with the two problems because I'm sure that your solution will survive the scrutiny that I put to it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. That was, that was sarcasm. It's one thing to sit in a studio like this 
and look at the problem dispassionately. It's another thing to be on the receiving end and to actually be involved in the suffering or the evil or the pain. Or Can we split is. those two questions? Yeah, I think we and start, have to split And start them. with the intellectual one because it's often presented as a proof against yeah, God's existence. That, 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 that's right. And oh, just softball him those questions, why don't you? Sorry, I know that's not relevant to the points he's making, but I just, I'm tired of these softball interviews. It's just so disingenuous. Whatever. Moving on. Sometimes I react to it and say, okay, there isn't a God. So you've solved the problem now. You've got an intellectual solution. And that's the way life is. And the wonder is perhaps that so many people have a half reasonable life, but that's just the way it is. Blind, pitiless indifference. So you get rid of the intellectual problem, but I notice what you don't get rid of, and that's the suffering. Yeah, okay. So here's an idea. Why don't we humans, I don't know, do something to help alleviate suffering? Gee, what a novel concept. <laughs> but nobody would do that, right? Even though that's exactly what people do, whether they believe in a god or not. Many people will go and help other people, sometimes putting their own life on the line to help other people, to prevent suffering, to amend suffering, to alleviate suffering, to end suffering whenever and wherever possible. Because at the end of the day, we humans are all we have got to respond to the situations that we see. Because what you're saying here is, yes, this is a real problem. So you're not saying that God solves the problem of evil. You're saying that there is a God and evil, bad stuff happens. So, okay, then that God that exists isn't doing anything about these bad stuff that's happening. That leaves us to deal with it. So, yeah, we've solved the intellectual problem but we haven't solved the problem. Sure, okay, let's go solve the problem because whether you believe in a God or not, we're still going to have to go and solve the problem. My word, John, seriously, give me something more to work with. Sure. But you do get rid of all hope. I'm sorry, I can't answer that phone right now. The voting is still going on for the new Outright Live Voice. So so we'll, we'll have to answer that later. By we, I mean all have to answer. And anyway, so no, you don't remove all hope. You don't. Because what do you mean by hope? I mean, what? what how, how do you remove all hope? No, because people are still going to help people. So how is that removing hope? I, I don't know. Now, it could be that that's how it is, and we have to face it. As Richard Dawkins said to me, that, you know, we've got to face it. Well, we do have to face it. So the question for me comes to this. Are there any grounds for believing? Wait, that red herring doesn't resolve the question at all, because believing is an independent question on whether or not you've resolved the problem of evil. Are you this dense, Lennox? Really? Maybe this is why he's never talked about math, because he would reveal that he really sucks at it, maybe. I'm just saying, I've never heard him talk about math, and I'm still irritated about that. Whatever, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm on a red herring now, too. He did it. It's okay that I do it. Oh, wait, that's a 2Q. Never mind. Moving on. Facing this head on, that there is a God. And what I'd want to say about that, I'd want to say a number of things about that. But the first is this that because I'm a Christian, I have the problem, the intellectual problem. But because I'm a Christian, I believe that Jesus Christ rose as a matter of history the third day, and that death is therefore not the end. Right, but that still doesn't alleviate the problem that we have in this life. It just means that for some people, there's going to be a great reward waiting for them on the other side. Woohoo. How did that solve the problem of the people suffering today? By offering them a reward later on. And that makes it all okay somehow, I guess. I'll give an analogy about this later on. And because death is not the end, I do believe that God is going to be utterly fair. 
so that people who have had the wrong end of injustice will be ultimately compensated for that. Unless, of course, they don't believe in the right God, then they're, then they're just screwed. So uh, that didn't really solve the problem for them. But John's not going to talk about that, and the, the dude that's asking him these softball questions isn't going to ask him that question. <laughs> uh, moving on. And atheists have no such hope. So what atheism does is it appears to give you an intellectual solution to the problem, but it removes all hope. It removes all hope of justice, which contradicts the very way in which we humans feel. We sense that there must be justice out there somewhere. Now, that doesn't prove there is. Wow, I was going to rant about how this doesn't prove that there is. Just because you feel like there's something doesn't mean that that something exists. But you just admitted that. So what's your whole point then? So what if there's no final justice? And by the way, in your system, there is only a final justice for the people who believe in the right thing. So the people who don't believe in the right thing are completely screwed no matter what bad things happen to them in life. They aren't going to get a justice. And this is a completely new type of theology where the, the punishment is put on the people who did bad for however much bad they did, but then if they've done some good, they'll get some good rewards. It sounds an awful lot like a totally different religion. Zoroastrianism? Yeah, it sounds a lot like Zoroastrianism to me. So maybe John is just a confused Zoroastrianist. But it might make us disposed to have a look at the evidence that there is justice. Now, I will now have to move over to the other side of this question. Where's the evidence that there is justice, John? You just said, well, it just because we have this feeling, that doesn't make it true. Right, I agree. And then you said, well, we'd have to look for the evidence. Yeah, where's the evidence? Why aren't you presenting that? You're just moving on? Present the evidence! Ah, uh, no, we don't have time for that. Let's talk about the emotional side of this. Because both sides now belong together. And, it, and it's this. You see, the heart of Christianity, for me, is not simply the resurrection. It's what preceded it. And we know that Jesus died. He was crucified. Now, that would be of very little significance. There were many crucifixions around the time, as Josephus, for example, records. But the significance of this particular one is the nature of the person who was crucified. The claim is that this is God incarnate. Now, a lot of people will find it very difficult to follow this, but it's good to see what the logic is. So try to come along with me. If this is God incarnate, the question is, what is God doing on a cross, to put it crudely and pointedly? I don't know. What is God doing on a cross? Maybe he's just chilling out, bored, because, you know, eternity just kind of got boring. I don't know. Seemed like a good idea at the time. I, w w how is this following your logic? I'm. I, so you're asking a question that pre-assumes all these things are already true without giving us any reasons to think that they are true. You said the word logic. I understand the word logic, but I don't think that you understand the word logic. I know you said it. Maybe you understand mathematical logic. Don't rant on the fact that I've never heard John Lennox talk about math. Uh, but yet, we're, we're, what? This, who cares what he's doing? I don't care. Why is that? How, well, I'm moving on. And what I would say about that is this, that at the very least, it shows me that God has not remained distant from the problem of human suffering, but has actually become part of it. Okay, that's so irrelevant for a multitude of reasons. First and foremost, it's God. He has all of eternity before and after that event to get over that event. There's this YouTube video that I need to link you in the description. Uh, God stubs his toe, which lays this out better than I could do here. So I'll just reference that video. Okay, even if 
we're saying that, that this suffering was way more than all of humanity has ever suffered or ever will suffer, and it's beyond anything that we could comprehend. It's, it's more suffering ever. It's still a finite moment in time to God. Even if you're saying, well, but God experiences all time at the same time, so he's constantly experiencing this pain, okay, that still doesn't resolve the pain and suffering of the other people. It just means that he understands the pain and suffering that they go through. It still doesn't change anything. So what's your point? Now that, to my mind, is a window into a possibility that brings real hope and historically has brought hope to millions of people. And this too is relevant, even though an idea can or does bring hope to people, that doesn't make the idea true. Okay? It just doesn't. You are going to win a million dollars. Maybe that will bring you hope. But it doesn't mean that you really are going to win a million dollars. Publisher's Clearinghouse got a hold of this idea, said you have may have already won. <laughs> yeah, well, that gets you excited. Oh, well, I may have already won. I'm already entered. All right, I'm, I'm on, yeah. You never get to the end. You never get to the end. You never get to the reward. Unless you're one of the people that they select randomly to actually win. Which, the odds against that are extraordinarily high. And they make a big production out of it for the very fact that it happens so seldom that you then think it happens more often than not. And, in fact... Those productions in and of themselves could be staged and fake. So how do we know somebody somewhere has actually won this money and there's all sorts of questions we could ask? We could be very skeptical of it. Anyways, putting aside that analogy, because I really don't like to argue to analogy, uh, but I think that my point here is just because it brings people hope or some people hope doesn't mean that it is real. And other people, it doesn't bring hope. Perhaps other people, it brings uh, despair. I had a... Uh, you want to go on personal accounts? I'll give you a personal account. I had a friend who was convinced that he had committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, so he was screwed. That caused him mental anguish to no end. But yet, he remained a Christian. Why he remained a Christian, I don't know, because what's the point? You're screwed, so might as well stop being a Christian, right? But whatever. So that didn't bring him hope. It brought him nothing but pain and mental anguish to think that this thing was true. So there's a counterexample there. But let's just ignore all of that because, you know, screw it, whatever. It brings hope to people, so that's a good thing. Even though, yeah, sure, bringing hope, that's nice. Doesn't make it true. Moving on. That have had to cope with the most awful of sufferings but somehow have had the strength to see that in the death of Christ there's a window into the heart of God that this is what God is like. So the question is really this. We find the universe to be ragged. There are some good things. There are some very bad things. Is there enough evidence amidst all of this raggedness to trust God? No, there's not. Thanks for playing. Well, my next video will be... What do you mean there's more to analyze? No, I'm done. I said no to his self-imposed question. He keeps changing the question. The question is this. No, the question was already given to you. You keep changing the question. Ah, oh, whatever. Moving on. For the ragged bits. And I would want to argue that the, the cross of Christ is not a simplistic solution to this. There will be the ragged ends, and I feel them. How the bleep is it a solution at all? All right, I really want to rant about this. I really want to make my analogy, but there's so much more to cover. So I think I'll do that now, because if I don't do it now, I'll forget about doing it, and you'll forget what the bleep I was trying to reference. So let's do that now, and by let's, I mean me. We'll do it, and you'll, whatever. Here it is. All right, so it's story time. So gather the kids. Actually, probably don't gather the kids because this is going to be a horrific story that you probably don't want to expose kids to. Anyways, here's the story. I break into your house. I break all your valuables that are completely irreplaceable, family heirlooms. I tie you up, tie up 
the rest of the family, and I waterboard each and every one of you. Then I take you out of the house and torch your entire house. Just burn it to the ground, blow up your car, and shoot all your pets. But then I load you into a limo, and I drive you to a mansion that I have paid for completely in full, and you don't have to pay tax, you don't have to do anything towards it. It's completely and totally paid for forever. It is yours. I hand you the deed. I untie you. I put you in nice clothing, new clothing. You have closets full of new outfits, brand new designer wear. You have all the shoes and such you could think of, big screen televisions. I hire Chef Ramsay to cook you a cake. And I say, well, you know, all that stuff I just did to you, I totally made up for it by doing this. Now, who wants to go through all that suffering to get that good stuff? Anybody out there raise their hands? Gibberish, are you raising your hand? Put your hand down. You're a weird guy, Gibberish. You haven't made a video in a while. Do that. And and you'll have to mention lobsters when you do that. Anyway, so, yeah. No, no, no one. And, and even if you do want to go through that sort of suffering to get the good stuff, would you call me a good person? No, I don't think you would. I'm a sociopath. I made you go through hell. The fact that I give you good stuff later doesn't make up for it. It just doesn't. That's not how we work in our brain. So why is it that a human that does this isn't like Harold as some sort of champion, yet when it comes to God, or at least this concept that Lennox has of God, because I've heard different concepts of God that are better than this concept, this concept of God rewards only those who believe the right thing, but still made them suffer or let them suffer and let other people suffer through tons of crap. How does the reward make up for any of that? It cannot. It does not. So if you're not now, you say, well, that's not God. God's not putting you through all that horrible stuff. Okay, let me change it slightly because I hear some people making that objection in my brain. All right. No, I really don't hear them. But anyways, stay with me here. Okay. So I see your house is on fire. I can save your house. But I watch it burn to the ground. You make it out alive with your family. And I then drag you to the hospital and give you the mansion, etc. Now, the fact that I stood by and didn't even call 911, did nothing while the house burned to the ground, but yet gave you the nice thing. Well, maybe you're glad that I gave you the nice thing, but does it really make up for the fact that I did nothing? That I didn't do a thing while the house burned to the ground? I just don't see that. I don't see the ends justifying the means, or the means justifying the ends. For humans, because we are limited and because we have lack of resources, time, energy, etc., sometimes the means justify the ends, but rarely. And it's a very dangerous thing to accept or embrace that idea without a strong line drawn. The ends justify the means in the case of giving somebody a shot hurts them but they need to receive that injection to live longer or prevent a disease. So the minor pain is justified by the greater reward of longer life or prevention of a disease, what have you. If we had a solution that could deliver that medicine in a non-painful way, we would be morally obliged to use that methodology. If we had a shot that did not hurt people and it was cheaper to use and safer to use than the old hypodermic needles, hospitals everywhere would have to carry them. We would demand that they do so. Imagine the hospital says, no, 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 we're not going to do it because the pain is, is, is okay because of the outcome. 
We said, but there's a better way. We just don't want to do it. The be- Why not? There's a better way.